Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, it is my pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for scheduling the meeting, the, my talk uh, so close to noon. That means by the time I end, I'll be ready to have breakfast. Um, so um, I'm, I guess one thing that's not obvious, uh, Martino Center is a part of the radiology department at uh, MGA. Um, and as the colorful, uh, my colorful title suggests, I, I, I will be talking about, uh, let's see the clicker. Uh, is the one that works? Yes. I will, um, my presentation to today will have three parts. First, uh, I will, uh, um, I'll try to take you through a quick journey through more than two decades of um, technological developments uh, that have led to the uh, current generation integrated Petter Mars scanners. <coughs> Next, uh, I will talk about how we can uh, synergistically use the, the simultaneously acquired uh, MR and PET uh, data. And uh, finally, I'm going to uh, say a few words about um, the ways uh, we can uh, integrate the multimodality data. And um, as, as a disclosure, I should have added it to my title because like Rene did, uh, in the last uh, two uh, parts of my talk, I'm going to focus uh, only on brain just to keep uh, the story more, uh, more uh, simple. Uh, the other thing I need to disclose is the fact that I'm going to talk only about simultaneous PET MR imaging. Some of the some of the techniques that I'm going to mention could, in principle, be applied to sequentially acquired data. But you know, I'm very biased. What can I say? <laughs> um, I'd like to start the technology focus uh, part of my talks with this uh, slide. It's an old slide. I've been using it for I think a decade with slight modification. It highlights uh, the fact that uh, combining PET-MR for the purpose of simultaneous imaging is not a trivial task. There are many things that, uh, many uh, factors that need to be considered. Uh, and highlighted here are only some of those, uh, the most obvious uh, aspects. Now we know by now everything about CT, we know everything about, uh, about MR, so let me give you in uh, 30 seconds a quick introduction to PET hardware. So as you know, in PET, we detect uh, the two 511 QV photons that are generated after a positron emission, uh, positron electron annihilation. And for this purpose, we surround our object with detectors. So a typical PET detector consists of a scintillator material that stops the 511 QV photon. It converts it into a visible light photon. Then we have a photon detector to convert that into an electrical current. When it comes to PET-MRI, we have three generations of, uh, of, um, of um, integrated scanners. Again, let me talk shortly. And those uh, three generations were based on the photon <coughs> detector technology available at the time. <coughs> Photomultiplier tubes have uh, long been the photo detector of choice in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in PET in general. Uh, but in the context of integrated PET-MR, they have the significant disadvantage of being magnetic field sensitive. However, those were the only uh, uh, photon detector uh, uh, detectors available at the time when the first effort to combine PET and MR were made back in the 90s. And uh, investigators had to find ways, clever ways to um, address uh, this uh, limitation. And this uh, example from uh, uh, from uh, Simon Ferry and Paul Marsden work uh, when they were uh, uh, both at UCLA, I believe. Um, they used uh, long optical fibers to couple the scintillator crystal placed at the center of the magnet to photomultiplier tubes located uh, outside the, outside <coughs> the magnet. Uh, using this system, they acquired for the first time uh, images. The top ones are uh, of ex vivo images of the cardiac uh, perfused rat. And the lower ones are, I believe, the first in vivo imaging ever acquired. And you know, just a fun story related to, to Emil's uh, uh, chicken wing, I think you showed. <laughs> During my PhD, I always thought this image was actually a chicken, not a rat. I don't know why, but uh, I don't know. To me, it looked like a chicken. So um, obviously, that first system had uh, several limitations. It, was, it provided a single slice through the object. You know, limited sensitivity and over the years several other generations several generations of devices have been have been developed to address some of those limitations either for improving the sensitivity or for increasing the um, uh, x-ray field of view i'm not going to go uh, into all those details uh, the second photon detector technology that uh, uh, i'm going to talk about is with the avalanche photodiodes this uh, technology uh, has actually allowed the PET-MR field to, to move from the preclinical to the clinical arena. 
Uh, they share some of the advantages of uh, PMPs, you know, uh, light sensitivity, for example, but more importantly, they are magnetic field insensitive, as shown in this image on the right. So several uh, generations, several scanners have been developed using this technology as well. My PhD project with Simon Ferry after he moved to UC Davis was to build this uh, 70 MR compatible PET insert for small animal imaging. And uh, for those of you in the audience developing PET scanners think that one day, four years of your life might uh, be on a third of a slide and uh, you'll spend 30 seconds talking about it. Um, Two other uh, scanners that uh, were uh, developed in parallel, uh, um, also for small animal scanners for the 70 and the 9.4 uh, 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 MR uh, small animal uh, uh, scanners were developed at UC Bigland and, and Brookhaven. However, the, uh, I guess more important for us is the human, uh, human scanners. Uh, the first uh, scanner capable of uh, simultaneous uh, uh, PET MR data acquisition for human was developed uh, by Siemens. It was um, actually a dedicated brain scanner uh, that uh, fit inside the board of the standard uh, state of the art at the time, uh, three tesla MR scanner that uh, uh, humans uh, had. Uh, we have been using uh, this uh, scanner for more than a decade for a variety of studies ranging from those of aimed at assessing the performance, uh, uh, mutual interference between the two modalities, to developing methods to take advantage of uh, simultaneous nature of uh, acquisition and then uh, exploring the tremendous potential of these CEG modalities in studies in, uh, in uh, animals, non-human primates, and humans, obviously. The experience gained with the brain pet prototype uh, allowed uh, Siemens to develop and introduce the first uh, whole body pet MR scanner, MR pet scanner, as they call it, um, the Biograph uh, MMR. In this case, you don't see an insert anymore. The two devices are fully integrated, both on the software side and on the hardware side. The, the, the PET detectors are were act actually placed in the space between the, if you can use this, in between the RF body coil and the gradient uh, coil of the system. Around the time when uh, APD-based uh, uh, devices uh, became uh, commercially available, another uh, uh, photon detec detection detector technology reached a level of maturity that um, allowed uh, 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 investigators to consider it for PET uh, applications. I'm talking about silicon photo multiplier chips, now Geiger Moore APDs, or they have several names, let's call, let's call them silicon photo multiplier chips for, for today. They um, again uh, have um, um, uh, shared some of the um, uh, desired properties of uh, PMPs when it comes to light sensitivity, they actually have uh, a lower power requirement and uh, as opposed to uh, APDs, they have uh, excellent timing properties. So in a way, they, uh, they are kind of, uh, they are becoming the photon detector of choice for, uh, for, uh, for PET MRI. And uh, as everything in this uh, field, uh, several uh, small animal uh, PET MR scanners uh, were developed for small animal imaging and uh, more recently also for, uh, uh, for uh, human brain imaging. You know, several prototypes are, are in different stages of uh, develop development around the world. More importantly again for us is that uh, GE uh, finally got involved in this field in back in 2013 to introduce their, uh, uh, their, uh, the first uh, silicon PM based uh, uh, PET MRI whole body uh, device. In this case, they uh, based it on their uh, uh, 7050 W, I think it's called the standard MR, um, three Tesla MR. They use the same uh, magnet, the same gradient system, uh, power amplifiers and so on, but they modified the body coil to allow the placement of the PET detectors inside it. Even more recently, United uh, Imaging from Shanghai, China, developed uh, uh, and introduced their uh, uh, silicon PM uh, based uh, 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 PET MRI scanner. Uh, as of uh, May uh, this year, uh, the scanner is FDA approved. I don't think they have any installed. I guess I didn't mention the number of scanners installed. There are about 100 for Siemens, several dozens for, uh, for GE as well. And I suspect by, 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 by next year, we'll, we'll start to see the first installations from uh, United as well. 
Um, as a summary of this part of my talk, there are currently several uh, uh, scanners uh, commercially available that you could use for simultaneous CAT MR imaging. And there are uh, several more in development, development, particularly dedicated brain scanners that uh, will like to become commercially available in the next few years. Okay, so for the second part of my talk, we'll change colors. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the synergistic use of the simultaneously acquired data. So the first thing that comes to mind is uh, obviously joint image reconstruction that has been pioneered by uh, some uh, people on this paper and some of the organizers. And uh, uh, it's, it's funny that when uh, Chris asked me to give a talk, uh, I actually, my first thought was, well, okay, what am I going to do? I'm, like, I'm going to come here and talk with the experts about all the great work that we've been doing over the years. So instead of uh, doing that, uh, I, uh, I went uh, back to the Oxford Dictionary and I looked at the definition of synergistic and I adapted it a little bit to, to PET MRI and that's what you get. So it's uh, related to the interaction of uh, or cooperation of PET and MR to produce a combined outcome greater than the sum of the sep their separate outcomes. So what does that mean? That means that if we relax the definition, if we make it more broader, as uh, Chris had mentioned in the introduction, we can include here some of the things we've been working for the last 10 years, the MR assisted by the data optimization. Uh, I'm going to tell you more about that shortly. Um, why do, you, why do I think that fits here? Well, if you think about uh, what we do there, we take the MR, we don't disturb the MR in any way, we use it to improve the PET data quantification usually, which means at the end we have uh, an outcome that's greater than the sum of the two parts. And of course, I need to mention machine learning because this is a yet a new approach to combine the multimodal data, so I'm going to say a few words about that. In general, I'm going to focus on three different things, attenuation correction, motion correction, and image enhancement. So uh, I'm going to start each, of each one of the sections with uh, no, like an introductory slide uh, for those of you who are not uh, that familiar with PET. Uh, in uh, one of the most important corrections that we have to do in PET is attenuation correction, and that's because the photons, as they travel from the place of uh, uh, annihilation to the detectors, they have a high probability of being absorbed in the, in the subject. So if that happens, we have bias quantification, we can have uh, image artifacts. And to make uh, things worse, when it comes to integrated PET MR, this is even more challenging because the MR signal depends on proton density, tissue relaxation times, and not electron density, density which is uh, related to attenuation correction. So when it comes to uh, brain imaging, obviously the biggest uh, challenge is how do we convert an MR image where you basically have no signal from bone to something that looks like a CT. I don't have time to talk about all the approaches. I'm not even going to talk about all the approaches we developed in our group. I'm just going to show you one example from uh, the, the, the method we are currently using on, on both our scanners. We have the brain pet and the MMR. So, um, this is an, uh, an, uh, a method that uses both pre-surfer and STM to generate an attenuation map of pseudo CT, as we call it, from uh, the mp data that we routinely acquire for all our uh, uh, brain studies. And we can appreciate the similarity between the pseudo CT and CT in this case. In fact, uh, this uh, method, and together with the 10 other approaches developed by other groups around the world, uh, has been uh, studied in, uh, in a multi-center setting and on a large uh, 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 number of uh, subjects, 80 subjects. Um, and uh, the conclusion of uh, that study was that the quantification bias because of attenuation introduced by, by attenuation correction or MR-based attenuation correction is actually smaller than the quantification reproducibility in PET imaging. So it's all problem, excellent. Motion, um, um, we are not talking about cardiac motion, but still we do studies that take anywhere from minutes to hours. We routinely we scan our subjects for 90 minutes. And as you know, motion is impossible to, uh, to, to avoid in these cases. It leads to blurring of the images, to attenuation emission mismatch, to bias quantification. Now, I talked about attenuation correction as a challenge. When it comes to motion, this is a great opportunity we have in the case of simultaneous acquisition. And that's because we can use the MR to, I don't even want to say it like that, 
let me take it back. We can use the information that we can uh, acquire in the background of the standard MR acquisitions to track the motion of the head in real time. So quite often for uh, uh, MR acquisitions, there are methods to perform real time motion tracking and correction. And the end of the, end of those acquisitions, we get motion corrected MR images. But since we acquire the data simultaneously, we can, uh, we can use those motion estimates to also uh, uh, correct the pet data retrospectively. So we are, uh, um, I believe, uh, one of the first groups who actually did this in humans. We showed in this example uh, that, uh, I should have included the algorithm, but uh, next time. Um, we, sh we, we, we developed an algorithm to incorporate these motion estimates into the, uh, and perform the correction before, uh, I guess, it's even before the image reconstruction, we adjust the LORs based on these motion estimates. And you can uh, appreciate the substantial improvement in image quality after motion correction. Over the years, we used this approach for uh, several research studies. Shown here are just two examples. Uh, I think those were published 2016. Okay, took several years to acquire the data, so that's why uh, the break. Uh, more recently, uh, Kevin Chen, who uh, was at the time uh, a graduate student in my lab, uh, looked at uh, the impact of uh, MR-based uh, uh, motion correction on static FDG images acquired in Alzheimer's uh, disease patients, so going more to the clinical relevances of these uh, corrections. And uh, he, um, again, you can appreciate the improvement in image quality, but he also showed that uh, uh, the, the, the relative changes the, the, the on the quantification side, the improvement is more substantial in uh, patients that uh, move a lot, as you can expect. So. Uh, in the plot on the in the plot on the on the bottom, these are subjects that exhibited a high amplitude motion compared to those who moved uh, less. The third thing I mentioned was I call it Im image enhancement. Let's say partial volume effect is part of the image enhancement uh, uh, you know, topic. So uh, partial volume effects are, uh, are due to the limited uh, spatial resolution in PET and tissue fraction effect, and uh, they uh, lead to biased uh, images. And uh, I show here uh, several, you know, it's a, it's a segmented brain, and, uh, and you have gray, matter, gray white matter, and uh, then blurred with uh, uh, um, different uh, filters. And I'm doing that because uh, when it comes to brain, quite often uh, this effect is spatially variant, and uh, what you get at the end is actually a combination of some of this, of several of these images as you move away from the center of the field of view. So the opportunity again we have in PETMR is to use the, um, so the opportunity we have in, uh, in, uh, in PETMRI is to actually use the high resolution inf uh, morphological information provided by MR to um, uh, address this issue in PET. And even before the first integrated PETMR scanner were introduced, many, many methods have been developed for, for the partial volume effect correction. And shown here are just two examples of, uh, of, um, of um, uh, what can be obtained using the so-called uh, GTM and RBV methods for two of the ratio tracers we are using uh, at the time. But a more elegant approach is to actually incorporate this imaging, this uh, morphological information in the image reconstruction. And this is um, work we've done in collaboration with Jimmy Chi. Um, and um, that shows that um, by using this, uh, this uh, uh, anatomy derived uh, from the MR images, even without segmentation, we can substantially improve the image uh, quality. Kevin, before uh, he graduated, he actually managed to put all, all this uh, together, and this is what I call by the by MR-assisted uh, pet data optimization, or MAPET, as the name he came up with. Um, this uh, allows us to um, derive uh, the information we need for attenuation correction, motion correction, uh, anatomy ID reconstruction, also the regions of interest for uh, region-based analysis, you know, post-processing analysis, all from six minutes of data we acquire normally uh, uh, for, uh, for the, all our brain studies. He went one step further and he, he started to look at the, the impact of this uh, 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 optimization on on the uh, uh, data we collected in dementia patients. And early results uh, suggest that, you know, again, the image quality is obviously substantially improved, but the early results uh, 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 
suggest that it could actually have a clinical impact, but of course we need to do larger studies to address this properly. So I mentioned machine learning. Well, uh, as you know, artificial intelligence is more and more widely used in healthcare, including in medical imaging and, uh, and uh, it reached our field as well. So this is an example again from Kevin's work, but not in my lab. It was uh, uh, after he moved to Stanford, uh, he's working with Greg Zaharczyk on, on using uh, deep learning methods to um, synthesize, let's call them high quality PET images from low dose MR images combined with the MR uh, information they use the three contrasts, three, three MR contrasts in this case. Uh, if you look at the images that uh, they are obtained in, uh, I believe it was a hundredth of the do dose, they, uh, you can see here the images that, uh, so the MR, the full dose PET, then the images uh, obtained with the PET plus MR model, so they use both the PET and the MR, all the, 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 the three contrasts I mentioned, the PET only model, all the, or just the low dose. And you can appreciate the substantial improvement by when using the, the PET MR uh, uh, model in this case. Uh, so that was the case of uh, static imaging. Uh, Quang Kong presented at uh, a recent uh, SMMI meeting another approach, uh, collaboration with Genius, huh? um, uh, to actually end the the um, um, anatomy, the, 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 I guess I wish I could read it later, to perform direct pet like reconstruction from low dose dynamic uh, uh, using unsupervised deep learning. So in this case, the MR information is an input to the network, but it was also used to uh, generate this uh, kernel matrix that's incorporated into the, into the convolutional neural network. And uh, Kong uh, showed a great uh, improvement in the, in, the, in the tumor. I'm showing here just as the tumor example. You, you see how the method, this method performs much better than even the kernel approach that I mentioned earlier. But of course, deep learning could be used for other reasons. You know, in the context of attenuation correction, this is uh, an example from uh, Alan McKillens uh, from uh, University of Wisconsin group. Uh, and, uh, in this case, they uh, show that uh, you can use uh, uh, you can use deep learning to generate uh, pseudo CT images from uh, from the MR data you know, and address the attenuation correction issue. Uh, however, do we really need even need to re to generate the attenuation maps? In this example from uh, from Young and all uh, from uh, UCSF, they actually show that uh, for uh, uh, they can uh, uh, perform the attenuation and scatter correction directly from the non-attenuation corrected uh, PET images. So, uh, I guess, I'm looking, I guess you can, you can appreciate again the substantial improvement and you can see how the, the, the bias in the resulting images is, is quite minimal when using the, 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 the proposed approach. Of course, this won't work for all the scenarios. It will require training data. It will require many things that we will probably be talking about uh, during the workshop. But for certain scenarios, it might actually uh, have potential. And now I, I talked about uh, how we can generate attenuation maps, how we can, uh, uh, how we can perform the corrections in image space without generating the attenuation maps. I guess you can see where I'm going with this. We can even replace completely the conventional way of reconstructing the images with, an, uh, with, an, uh, with a deep learning approach as suggested my, by my colleagues uh, uh, for, uh, for, FM, for, for MRI data. In this case, they, uh, as you can see, they used undersampled data and they were able with this automap uh, method to reduce the error substantially uh, uh, compared to the conventional image reconstruction. So for the third part of my talk, I'm going to uh, uh, discuss some of the ways we can uh, uh, combine the multimodal uh, uh, data. Um, uh, as you can appreciate from this table, PET and MRI provides complementary information uh, 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 about the brain. And this data have long been combined either uh, by performing side-by-side uh, uh, -side analysis or by uh, 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 performing simultaneous acquisition more recently. So the, I'll start with three more clinical examples. The first one is AD, 
um, as I mentioned already, we started to look at that uh, in the context of, uh, of uh, analysis of bad data optimization. But as you can appreciate from this paper from Julie, that was uh, from a paper that was published back in 2012, uh, MR and PET provide a lot of information in, in the case of AD patients. And uh, we have the opportunity to actually uh, um, begin to assess the relationship between the par parameters that we derive uh, from the two modalities. More importantly, um, performing uh, the acquisition simultaneously, I think it's a major convenience in these patients, which are often uh, fragile el elderly subjects. And uh, this was a one-stop st one uh, uh, examination proposed by, uh, by uh, uh, Alex and Henrik Bartel from Germany, in which they suggested that uh, in uh, um, suggesting a new protocol for acquiring all the data required for clinical uh, diagnosis from a short uh, one session, 20 minute acquisition. Now, uh, I think uh, if we add the MR assisted bed op optimization to this one stop shop protocol, we can actually get the acquisition time to even uh, uh, less than 20 minutes and which would be, uh, 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 I'm sure, greatly appreciated by, by the patient. The first patient population we actually studied with the brain pet was brain tumor patients, glioblastoma patients, and this is just one example. I have many more, but not, I'm not going to show you those today. This is an interesting example because it's, it's um, you know, the, the, the pet in this case is just, just those two images uh, that shows you how much more information the MR provides in this context. The pet tracer in this case was uh, uh, actually the radio labeled ver version of uh, chemozolomide. Chemozolomide is the chemo chemotherapeutic agent that's uh, routinely used in this patient. And the question in this case was how does uh, the delivery of chemozolomide, uh, uh, the distribution of chem chemozolomide in the tumor change uh, when anti-angiogenic agents are also uh, given to this patient? So it, this, this modality begin, begins to allow us to, to address some of this uh, more uh, clinically relevant and quite interesting questions. Um, the third example is uh, uh, um, um, a case study from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Henrik Bartel from, from uh, Leipzig, in which uh, they uh, uh, showed in a stroke patient that uh, by performing the simultaneous, uh, the, the, the acquisition simultaneously, we can begin to try to cross-validate, cross-evaluate methods that uh, uh, have been used in uh, stroke for uh, many decades, actually. And we can begin to address, for example, the uh, ongoing debate between the PET penumbra and the perfusion diffusion mismatch. This is something you couldn't do separately just because the changes in these patients occur on a matter of a few minutes. So it, uh, you'd, uh, you'd have different brain states uh, uh, if, you, if you did the data, if you acquired the data sequentially. Uh, now going back to our early days, uh, we, uh, uh, when uh, shortly after we installed the brain pet, I guess, we uh, um, looked at several research applications. So this uh, first example um, involves uh, uh, Let's call it smart probe. Uh, it will change on the next title, actually, it doesn't. Um, as you know, MR uh, contrast agents uh, uh, change the um, uh, relaxation of tissue wash, uh, water, and the, uh, the magnitude of that relaxation enhancement called uh, relaxivity changes uh, 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 based on a number of uh, molecular factors. And modulating those factors leads to a change in MR signal. And because of this, <coughs> over the years, uh, many, uh, several smart agents have been designed to be responsive to various things like different ion concentrations, temperature, pH, as shown in this example. However, one uh, problem with those, all those approaches is that we usually have two measurements and one, uh, two, two unknowns and one measurements. What do I mean by that? The signal that we are measuring uh, with MR depends on both the relaxivity and the probe concentration. If you do the experiment in vitro, the probe concentration is known, it doesn't change. So any change you see is related to the change in relaxivity. However, if you do the experiment in vivo, the probe concentration is unknown, it changes and it can actually vary in disease versus, uh, versus uh, normal uh, uh, tissue. So what can we do about that? Well, we can uh, develop smart bimodal MR PET probe that can uh, give us that uh, second measurement that we need to solve for the two unknowns we have. Uh, Luca uh, Frulano in uh, Peter Kerben's lab uh, uh, developed such a probe 
uh, in, uh, in, uh, back in back in almost a decade ago, and he showed good uh, that uh, we can obtain good correspondence between the pH uh, uh, measurements obtained with the uh, 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 MRPET and the electrode measurements. This was done only in phantom studies. But I think it was one of the papers who uh, got accepted in the least amount of time. Um, this next example comes from uh, Christine Sander. Uh, it, this is, I think, uh, the first paper that really showed in vivo the benefit of simultaneously acquired, uh, uh, acquiring the uh, PET and MR uh, data. So uh, the aim of this study was to look at the relationship between the hemodynamic response and uh, the changes in receptor occupancy, you know, hemodynamic response measured with fMRI, obviously, and changes in receptor occupancy measured assessed with the PET in response to pharmacological challenge. So the pharmacological challenge in this case was reclopride. Reclopride was also the radio tracer, but if you inject cold reclopride, unlabeled reclopride at a mass dose, that's, that's a pharmacological challenge. And as you can see from these uh, images, when we increase the reclopride, uh, reclopride mass dose, we can see uh, changes, you know, a decrease in the binding potential. And we also see an increase in the CBV. No, the two corresponding space, they, they are both uh, collocated in the D3, D, D2, D3, uh, D3 receptor rich region in the brain. More interestingly, when you look at the temporal response measured with the two, you see here the, the estimates of the binding potential and the CBV during the experiments, they match in time as well. Even more interesting when, um, so, should have mentioned, I guess, that the reclopride in this case is an, it's an antagonist, but when you look at an agonist, quintirol in this case, and you look at the temporal responses, you see that the CBV response peaks after about two minutes and then returns to baseline after uh, about 10 minutes, while the PET response changes throughout the whole uh, PET, uh, PET data acquisition. So what does that tell us? Well, the first model predicts a classical receptor occupancy model, but the second model actually suggests that we can have receptor internalization and it is by looking at the divergence between the two signals would allow us to actually begin to understand the mechanism of uh, receptor in internalizations in vivo, which is something that uh, couldn't be done before. More recent work from uh, Christine, she tried to address uh, one of the other uh, debates in the field and that is uh, if uh, changes in uh, cerebral blood flow actually affect the kinetics of the radio tracer, you know, the, the, the delivery, the washout and so on. And uh, for this, he, uh, for this she, she performed the studies uh, using a hypercapnia challenge and she assessed the changes in cerebral blood flow using uh, fMRI. And as you can see from this experiment, the changes are quite dramatic, up to 200% changes in, in CBCs in the cerebral blood flow, but there was virtually no effect on the reclopride or chalipride data uh, 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 acquired simultaneously. Finally, uh, the last example I'm going to give you is, uh, is, uh, comes from uh, Jacob Hooker's group, uh, the Marginal Center. Um, in this case, they proposed uh, using uh, uh, FDG in a novel way. So instead of the typical bolus effusion that uh, is usually used for, uh, for uh, virtually on oncology studies, instead of doing that, we inject the FDG as an infusion. So by doing that, we can start to look at the dynamic changes in glucose metabolism in the brain. And shown here are the, the time activity curves from the control region, <coughs> while we use the visual stimuli. So the control region in this case was the frontal cortex and our target region was the occipital and the visual cortex. And uh, we used, so we used this novel way of administering the, the radio tracer and novel ways to analyze the data. This is a GLM um, uh, model uh, uh, of the signal. On the right, you can see the activation maps obtained from that data. Of course, we can combine that with fMRI um, and uh, that would allow us to not only look at changes in glucose metabolism, but also to changes in oxygen utilization and so on that would allow us to begin to address those, uh, those some very interesting que questions when it comes to understanding how our brain works. However, we uh, and others have uh, quickly realized that the current technology uh, uh, puts limits on the temporal resolution we can, uh, we can uh, uh, have for our measurements. In this example from Andreas Hahn's group from, uh, from Vienna, uh, they showed that uh, 
the time activity curves uh, obtained are, uh, are quite noisy when we go down with the task block uh, down to, uh, to a few minutes. So uh, that's uh, nicely captured in this uh, table from Christian and Sven's uh, paper uh, that shows that the temporal resolution of PET is currently on the order of minutes, closer to 10 minutes, I guess. Uh, depends on the tracer and other things, but it's uh, definitely one order of uh, magnitude uh, uh, worse than the temporal resolution of uh, fMRI. So what can we do about this? Well, now we go back all the way to the beginning. I started with hardware, methods, applications. We go back to the beginning. There's even the color change on the side. We build better scanners. That's what we want to do. So that's what we started to do. We want to build a 7PMR compatible PET camera that has an order of magnitude higher uh, sensitivity, which in the end will translate in higher temporal resolution. So how do we plan to do that? Well, we change the geometry of the PET scanner to maximize the solid angle carving. Now we cannot build an explorer scanner with a um, two meter long field of view inside the MR, but by changing from a cylindrical geometry to a spherical geometry, the solid angle coverage is around 70%. I should have asked if it's, a, it's around 70%. And we actually showed in, uh, in uh, simulations that uh, this would allow us to achieve a sensitivity of around 25%. And it moves from the center of the sphere, it moves actually to the, to the region where the, 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 cortex is, the cortex is actually located and it goes to values higher than 25%. If we also build uh, this with uh, high performance detectors, and that's something we need to do to, um, to improve the detection efficiency, we plan to use uh, uh, detectors with uh, DOI and time of flight capabilities, we uh, can also take advantage of the so-called time of flight sensitivity amplifier effect, and all of a sudden our apparent uh, sensitivity will be uh, closer to 50. <coughs> to conclude my talk, uh, I, I decided to use this uh, this slide, I'm quoting myself from a radiology editorial I wrote uh, earlier this year. So in, uh, in that editorial, I, uh, I talked about how uh, uh, in the not too distant future, it will be possible to combine all these uh, hardware and software uh, approaches to dramatically improve the, the, the performance of, uh, of PET. And in here, uh, to paraphrase Aristotle, it's not the sum is uh, more than the parts, it's, I guess the product is more than the, the factor, the product, uh, product of the factors is, is higher than the, uh, in the end. Um, you, I gave some numbers there. I, I, you know where the 2050 comes now. Uh, the 100, uh, should have been green, I wish everything should have been easier to see anyway. It's the 100 comes from that Kevin's paper uh, and then uh, I just assign a two to five uh, range for uh, MR assisted uh, optimization. And that will actually get you to this uh, 10,000 fold improvement. Now, I know that sounds crazy. I will the first to admit that. Uh, however, I cannot tell you where this breaks for certain applications. I can see how for certain applications you can actually get to this, uh, this uh, factor of, of 10,000. And I'm sure you'll convince me that uh, there are other physical uh, things that I'm not uh, considering right now, but uh, let's see where it goes. Now, what this would allow us, would allow us to turn PET into a non-ionizing radiation modality. It's, you can read the editorial and you'll see how I compare this with the radiation we get from eating bananas or uh, drinking the water at home. Um, of course, if I were to update um, uh, this slide after the symposium, I would combine the uh, uh, machine learning approaches and the MR assisted optimization as I do today in the, in the bucket, the synergistic use uh, uh, of the simultaneous, simultaneous acquired data uh, category, uh, obviously led uh, multimodal data integration. But the other thing I would do, I would add uh, this, I would emphasize more the bi-directional uh, nature of uh, this development. Um, I think I talked today about how simultaneous PET-MR led to the, to the synergistic use the reason we are all here to the multimodal data integration, but I showed this the cyclic uh, nature of this uh, of this uh, process with uh, development, uh, hardware development leading to to methods development, leading to applications, back to hardware, and so on and so on. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my many collaborators from uh, from the Marquino Center, many people that I won't have time unfortunately to mention today, 
uh, many of our partners from, uh, from, from uh, uh, Siemens. And for those of you who missed the fireworks today, uh, last night, um, just uh, two, two pictures I took. And uh, the one thing that I couldn't quite tell was uh, if they were uh, all happy because we are all here for the workshop or uh, if they were celebrating these guys. Uh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>